If we look through different lists of the biggest religions in the world, Hinduism is often at somewhere at the top of that list. It is often ranked as the maybe third or fourth largest religion in the world, with an enormous following of over one billion people. In this series of videos, I want to explore the vast religion of Hinduism, as well as other religions with origins in the Indian subcontinent, which are often known as the Dharmic religions. But I will have a bit of a different approach to this. I will not be asking questions like what is Hinduism, as that will be plagued with a lot of problems. What we call Hinduism is such a vast and broad term that it's questionable if it can even be called a religion at all. It should really properly be seen as an umbrella term for a vast amount of different religious traditions from India, which can sometimes be drastically different from each other. Now much of this can of course be said about other religions too. Christianity is also an umbrella term of sorts for a vast amount of different traditions, as is Islam. Uh, but when it comes to Hinduism, this is true to an unusual degree. Some even want to say that Hinduism is actually many different religions altogether that is only artificially uh, sort of unified into a single whole. And while this may be a question of semantics, I generally don't like to go this far. Sure, Hinduism is a very slippery term that denotes many different, sometimes very loosely connected religious traditions in India, but they all have certain characteristics or core features that unify them and which also separates them from other religions in the region like Buddhism or Jainism. And the primary unifying characteristic of this vast category called Hinduism, what ties it all together, you could say, is its basis in and relationship to the scriptures known as the Vedas. So in this series I will not be asking questions like what is Hinduism, as I said, but instead I will be focusing on specific subjects, particular subjects that will serve as representations of this vast religion. So that includes the different scriptures, different great theologians and philosophers, as well as how Hinduism functions as a living religion both historically and today. And what better place to start than with the foundational and most important sacred scriptures in Hinduism, the Vedas. Now, Hinduism is sometimes called the oldest still existing religion in the world. And this is somewhat of an oversimplification, since many of the core features that we recognize as Hinduism appears quite late in history, in a few centuries into the Common Era. Um, but at the same time, some of the foundations of what we call Hinduism date back very far back in history. Indeed, the earliest Veda scriptures are some of the oldest surviving religious literature in all of history. History. While they weren't written down until much later, it is said that the earliest f parts of the Vedas were written sometime around 1500 BCE. The Vedas are considered revealed scripture, called Shruti in Sanskrit. In other words, they were not written by human hands, but revealed directly by the gods to the ancient sages who then memorized them. These sages and quote-unquote authors of the Vedas are called rishis, and the revelations that these rishis received are all in the language called Sanskrit, which is a language that belongs to the larger Indo-Iranian and Indo-European language group. The origins of this culture and its textual tradition is somewhat shrouded in mystery, and there are many different theories. Generally, it is thought that the Vedic culture, as it has become known, immigrated into this Indian subcontinent during the second millennium BCE from west, from the west, and is part of the ethnic group known as the Aryans. It was thus not native to India, but came from further west, and shares cultural and religious origins with the people of what is today Iran and with the greater Persian region. Although this can be quite a controversial subject for some, and as I said, much of this is quite uncertain still. What is clear is that the earliest Veda text appeared in a religious context in northern India, accompanied with certain ritual traditions that involved uh, ritual sacrifice. Now the Vedas can be quite complicated in their structure and, and you know, different parts, but generally they are divided into four categories. The Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Atharveda. 
The earliest of these is the Rig Veda, composed as early as around 1500 BCE. The others were written during the following centuries, being composed somewhere between 1200 to 800 BCE. The Vedas were originally oral traditions and were not written down until later. Uh, so if we take the oldest, for example, the Rig Veda, the hymns and mantras that it contains were orally transmitted between masters and students with minute detail, both the words and sounds, but also specific melodies and pronunciations. This tradition even continues to this day, so that when you listen to priests reciting the Vedas today, you are listening to the exact way that they would have sounded thousands of years ago. To quote Michael Witzel, it's, quote, something like a tape recording of circa 1500 to 500 BCE. The main part of these four Veda collections are, uh, consists of hymns to the gods and mantras to be recited while performing the ritual sacrifice. The Vedic culture and religion that had emerged at this time was a highly ritualized religion in which a class of priests called the Brahmins would perform various rites. One of the central rituals and one that is mentioned a lot in the Vedas is the uh, Soma ritual. Now, Soma was a drink that was consumed. And so naturally a lot of uh, speculation has gone into figuring out what this drink actually was and or consisted of. We don't actually know for sure. Naturally, of course, many people have speculated that it may have contained certain psychedelic compounds and that maybe the rishis who composed the Vedas did so under the influence of this Soma drink. Another very important ritual at this time was the Shrauta, which involved a ritual fire. In this ritual, the priests would offer different objects like food and drink to the gods by throwing them into the fire while reciting certain mantras and prayers. This fire throwing, this fire sacrifice or fire offering, was the main ritual in all of the early Vedic religion and was central to the worldview and the order of the universe for the Vedic people generally. The ritual sacrifice and the offerings functioned as a kind of exchange. The gods were given gifts and in return human beings received blessings of different sorts and this exchange between the human and divine world is what kept the universe, society and nature in its proper order. So all of these Vedas are deeply interconnected with the ritual practices of the Brahmin religion. They are the contents of and uh, you could say guide books for how to perform these Vedic rites. And the hymns that these Vedas contain give us some loose idea of what the theology of the time looked like. There are certain gods that are especially prominent, like Agni, the god of fire, and Indra, among many others, but the specifics of how these gods function is a difficult question to answer. There are clearly many different gods mentioned in the Vedas, which indicates a polytheistic religion, but we also find statements like the following in the Rig Veda, quote, God is one, men call him by various names, which seems to indicate a theology where there is one god in reality and the other gods mentioned are only different names or aspects of this god. And this does seem to predict certain later developments in Hinduism. Some deities in the hymns seem to be personification of things like natural phenomena, but not all of them are. Some of the gods probably were old kings or human beings that were deified after death, which was a very common practice for ancient polytheistic religions. But we're going to make things even more complicated. So these four Vedas, the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Athar Veda, are also divided into different sections. So number one is the Samhitas, which this is the part that we've discussed so far. This is the oldest and main part of the Vedas, the hymns and mantras to the gods. This is what we've been talking about. Sometimes when we talk about the Vedas in a more narrow sense, it is simply only referring to the Samhitas. So this is really the, the central, the main part of the Vedic corpus. But Usually when we say the Vedas, we're talking about a larger collection of texts than simply the Samhitas, and this includes these other categories, which includes number two, the Brahmanas, which are commentaries that try to explain and contextualize the deeper meanings of the Vedic rituals. There is the Aranyakas, which discuss the ritual sacrifice and its deeper meanings as well. And lastly, there are the Upanishads, which is quite different from the rest. The Upanishads are philosophical 
philosophical texts that discuss various aspects of life and death, the soul, meditation, and much, much else. So to make things extra clear, each of the four Vedas has all of these four sections or layers to them. The last part of the Vedas, the Upanishads, are especially fascinating in this context and would come to play a very significant and important role in the later development of what we recognize as Hinduism today. Whereas the other parts of the Vedas are usually only really interested in uh, the, the rituals, the Vedic rituals and their meaning, the Upanishads are highly speculative, philosophical, and they introduce many new concepts and, and ideas that are not present, or just doesn't seem to be present at least in the other parts of the Vedas. The Upanishads are also sometimes referred to as Vedanta, which literally means the end of the Vedas, because it is literally the end of the Vedas, both in, in the sense of being the last part of the Vedas that was written, but also functions as the last section of the Vedas. Written sometime in the middle of the first millennium BCE, the Upanishads continue the say, speculation and tradition of the Brahmana texts by trying to find the deeper meanings of the Vedic rituals. But it probably also has origins outside of this ritual culture. Primarily in the northeastern part of India, there had appeared what is known as the Shramana movement. There is some disagreement on whether this was a part of the Vedic religion, that it grew out of this already existing Vedic tradition, or if it was an independent movement altogether. In any case, the Shramana movement was characterized by individuals living ascetic lives, trying to find enlightenment or liberation through turning inward. So instead of the Vedic focus on external ritual and the centrality of the sacrifice for upholding the universe, the Shramana ascetics looked within themselves to find the answers. And indeed, it seems like it was with the Shramana movement that some of the more characteristic aspects of the Dharmic religions originated. Ideas like karma and samsara, that is ideas about reincarnation and that our actions, not just the ritual sacrifice, but all our actions, determine the nature of that reincarnation. There was also, among these Shramana mystics, there was the idea of moksha, or liberation. The idea that the goal of life should be to end this cycle of rebirths and to be liberated from them altogether. And this does not seem to have been present as an idea in the earlier Vedic religion. For those scholars who argue that the Shramana movement was something separated from the Vedic religion originally, they argue that it was as a result of the meeting of the Vedic ritualized religion and the Shramana movement that produced the Upanishads, this kind of synthesis between these two religious traditions. The Upanishads in fact seem to take ideas and concepts and themes from the earlier Veda scriptures and give them a new philosophical meaning inspired by the ideas of the Shramana movement. But others interpret them not as new meanings but simply as deeper meanings or understandings of the already existing Vedic uh, concepts. So there's a bit of disagreement here as well. For example, the concept of Brahman, which had previously signified the power of the ritual sacrifice and its ability to uphold the world, became a central theme in the Upanishads and was extended even further to mean the very foundation and ground of existence and the universe. Everything comes from the Brahman, everything returns to the Brahman, and according to some interpretation, everything is the Brahman. Another very important theme that appears in the Upanishads is the idea of the Atman, or the transcendent self, which seems in some way to be connected to, part of, or even identical with the Brahman. Now, many different traditions and interpretations of these Upanishads appeared over the coming centuries, which have together often come to be known as Vedanta. Um, so, and, and this can look very different. So, for example, um, the scholar Adi Shankara uh, interpreted the Upanishads in a very in a non-dual way, uh, which gave rise to the school known as Advaita Vedanta. Whereas, on the other hand, the scholar Madhvacharya interpreted them in a 
dualistic way and gave rise to Dvaita Vedanta, which is quite different. And we will indeed be exploring many of these thinkers and schools in future videos. Indeed, these sages behind the Upanishads can in some way represent a form or a certain uh, strand of the Shramana movement that adopted the earlier Vedic text as authoritative scriptures. Whereas other Shramana movement, indeed uh, religions like Buddhism and Jainism actually originated as Shramana movements. And, and, but they can be seen as Shramana uh, ascetics that did not accept the authority of the Vedas. The Vedas are not uh, sacred scriptures to either the Buddhists or the Jains. Uh, so this is a difference between them. There were Shramana ascetics who did not accept the authority of the Vedas, which created things like Buddhism and Jainism, but the sages that did accept the authority of the Vedas, it is they who seem to have produced the, the Upanishads, and which also then led to Hinduism. Thus, through the meeting of the Shramana movement and the core tradition of Brahmana Vedic ritual religion and their consolidation in the literature of the Upanishads, the Vedic religion was fundamentally transformed. Ideas like samsara, karma, and moksha became central concepts that would remain cornerstones of all the traditions, the religious traditions in India that followed. In other words, through this last part of the Vedas and their influence, we are one step closer to something resembling Hinduism today. To put it simply, the Vedas are a massive collection of texts of many different parts and different kinds of texts. And it would take further centuries of an enormous amount of different uh, commentaries and, and interpretations and schools of thought before we reach something that resembles Hinduism. So let me know in the comments if there's any other specific topic within this larger subject of Hinduism or the Dharmic religions that you would like me to to tackle or cover. Um, this is, there's a lot to to go through here, of course, and, and and I have a lot of things that I want to talk about, of course, but I would love to hear your suggestions as well. As always, I want to thank my Patreon supporters uh, who make this channel possible. It is really only through your support that I'm able to uh, well, for example, buy books to research these videos and, and for many other things. So it is really you guys who keep this channel going. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. As always, of course, I would like to also go through some of the recent arrival to our Patreon team. I would like to thank Mohamed Babaker, Yasir Khan, Yachuba, Davis, Ethan Ross, Wael Mohammed, and Pervez Rashid. Thank you all so much for your support. I hope this introduction to the most sacred scriptures of Hinduism wasn't too complicated. It is a difficult topic, of course, and a vast one, and one that is shrouded in a lot of mystery, and yet it is one that is very important to understand Hinduism, which is, after all, one of the largest and most influential religions in the world. So, I'll see you next time.